Less than three hours after SpaceX scrubbed Starship Flight 8 on Monday afternoon, the company immediately announced a new Flight 8 launch schedule for as soon as Wednesday, March 5th. This demonstrates their ability to swiftly assess issues when unexpected problems arise and their remarkably fast error resolution, far surpassing the delays we have seen from other space agencies in the past. This minor delay stems from ignition-related pressure issues with the booster, which we analyzed in detail in the previous episode. If you missed it, be sure to watch it to gain a deeper understanding of the root cause of this issue. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to receive the latest information about space every day. The countdown was halted at T-40 seconds, briefly resumed after troubleshooting, but was ultimately aborted when onboard systems detected further anomalies. SpaceX founder Elon Musk commented on X that there were too many question marks about this flight, suggesting a cautious approach of destacking the rocket, inspecting both stages, and rescheduling. This decision underscores the company's focus on reliability, especially after Flight 7's upper stage failure prompted hardware changes like improved fuel feed lines, adjusted propellant temperatures, and a new thrust target. SpaceX has rescheduled the launch for no earlier than 5.30 p.m. Central Time from its Starbase facility near Boca Chica Beach in South Texas. This test flight, known as Starship Flight 8, aims to build on previous missions while addressing challenges faced in the program's ongoing development. The launch window on March 5th will open at the aforementioned time, with a live webcast expected to begin approximately 40 minutes prior, streamed via SpaceX's X account and official mission page. This flexibility is typical of the Starship program, which prioritizes putting flight hardware in real-world conditions to accelerate learning and refinement. Flight 8 will involve Booster 15, the Super Heavy first stage, and Ship 34, the upper stage spacecraft, marking the second flight of a Block 2 ship configuration. The mission objectives echo those of the partially successful Flight 7, which took place on January 16, 2025. During that test, SpaceX achieved a significant milestone by catching the Super Heavy booster with the chopstick arms of its Mechazilla launch tower, a feat it hopes to repeat as the third successful catch in Flight 8. However, Flight 7 saw the upper stage lost due to a propellant leak that led to its destruction over the Atlantic Ocean, prompting design tweaks for this upcoming mission. Certainly, Starship's Flight 8 is poised to be a groundbreaking milestone, laying the foundation for two critical components in the vehicle's launch and recovery profile, which are essential to SpaceX's long-term ambitions. Beyond its immediate objectives, Flight 8 is designed to unlock capabilities that will redefine space exploration supporting SpaceX's vision of interplanetary travel and its commitments to NASA's lunar missions. The mission's success hinges on two ambitious goals, demonstrating the hardware and techniques necessary for future booster recovery and paving the way for in-space refueling operations, both of which are linchpins in achieving a fully reusable and sustainable spaceflight ecosystem. First and foremost, Flight 8 will serve as a proving ground for the advanced recovery systems that SpaceX has been refining since the Starship program's inception. Central to this effort is the attempt to catch the Super Heavy Booster 15 using the towering Mechazilla launch structure's innovative chopstick arms. This audacious maneuver, which SpaceX first successfully executed in June 2024 and repeated in Flight 7 in January 2025, involves the 232-foot booster descending precisely onto the launch tower after separating from the upper stage. The goal is to snare it mid-air, eliminating the need for traditional landing legs and enabling rapid reuse, a cornerstone of SpaceX's cost reduction strategy. For Flight 8, the company aims to achieve its third consecutive booster catch, further validating the reliability of this hardware and the sophisticated guidance systems that make it possible. Success here would solidify Mechazilla's role as the backbone of future recovery operations, potentially allowing SpaceX to refurbish and relaunch boosters within hours rather than weeks or months, a transformative leap in launch cadence. The second critical element of Flight 8 lies in the upper stage, Ship 34, and its potential to unlock the holy grail of space logistics, in-space propellant transfer. A successful test of this Block II configured spacecraft would set the stage for a future demonstration of refueling in orbit, a capability SpaceX has identified as indispensable for its Mars colonization plans and NASA's Artemis program. During this flight, Ship 34 will carry four mock Starlink satellites, simulators mimicking the next generation spacecraft, 
and conduct a series of experiments, including in-space Raptor engine relight and re-entry tests. While Flight 8 itself won't perform a refueling operation, a stable upper stage performance would provide SpaceX with the confidence and data needed to attempt such a maneuver in a subsequent mission, possibly as early as Flight 9 or 10. The ultimate aim is to establish an orbital propellant depot, where one starship could transfer liquid methane and oxygen to another, enabling extended missions beyond low Earth orbit. This technology is vital for reaching the Moon, Mars, and beyond, as it would allow a fully fueled starship to depart from orbit without the constraints of Earth's gravity well. These twin objectives, booster recovery and upper stage reliability, carry immense weight for SpaceX's broader roadmap. The Mechazilla catch is more than a technical stunt. It's a proof of concept for a reusable launch system that could slash the cost of access to space by orders of magnitude. Meanwhile, in-space refueling would transform Starship from a powerful rocket into a versatile spacecraft capable of sustained operations in the cosmos. Together, they address the dual challenges of affordability and endurance, which have long been barriers to humanity's expansion into the solar system. Flight 8's outcomes will also have immediate implications for NASA, which has tapped Starship as the human landing system for Artemis III, scheduled for 2026. A successful test would bolster confidence in SpaceX's ability to deliver a lunar-capable vehicle on time, while any setbacks could ripple through the agency's tightly choreographed plans. Also, in a lunar achievement, Firefly Aerospace's Blue Ghost 1 lunar lander touched down on the surface of the moon on March 2nd, a key milestone for the company and NASA's lunar exploration efforts. The spacecraft touched down at 3.34 a.m. Eastern, a little more than an hour after it started maneuvers to descend from a low orbit around the moon. The company said the lander was in an upright, stable position. We have confirmation Blue Ghost stuck the landing, the company announced on social media just after touchdown. This small step on the moon represents a giant leap in commercial exploration. Congratulations to the entire Firefly team, our mission partners, and our NASA customers for this incredible feat that paves the way for future missions to the moon and Mars. Everything was as planned. You could see everything was within margins, Jason Kim, chief executive of Firefly Aerospace, said at a post-landing briefing. From my observation, the team just nailed it. The mission team was calm and collected during its descent, he said earlier on stage at an event near the company's headquarters here, but after we saw everything was stable and upright, they were fired up. It really did go according to plan. Ray Allensworth, spacecraft program director at Firefly, said at the briefing, not requiring mission controllers to implement any contingency plans. She said the landing was within a 100-meter ellipse designated for the mission, but did not immediately have more details on the accuracy of the landing. The planned landing site was near Mons Le Trail, a volcanic feature in Mare Crisium, a basin in the northeastern quadrant of the near side of the moon. The site was selected to avoid magnetic anomalies that could disrupt the operations of some instruments. The landing location also has few rocks, on or below the surface, that could prevent one instrument, a heat probe, from drilling up to three meters below the surface. Firefly said it was the first commercial company in history to achieve a fully successful moon landing. Intuitive Machines landed its IM-1 lander on the moon in February 2024, but the spacecraft suffered a hard landing and tipped on its side. Although it was still able to operate and return data for a week, Blue Ghost launched on January 15 on a Falcon 9, sharing a launch with the Resilience Lunar Lander from Japanese company Ispace. It entered orbit around the moon on February 13, later maneuvering into a low lunar orbit before the landing attempt. Blue Ghost carries 10 payloads for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services CLPS, program under a $101.5 million contract. Among them are instruments to measure subsurface heat flow, the structure and composition of the Moon's interior, and the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetic field. Other payloads will study how the lunar regolith interacts with the materials and test a radiation-tolerant computer and an electrodynamic dust shield. The lander is expected to operate through sunset at the site on March 16th. Allensworth said in an interview after landing that controllers were working to commission the nine powered payloads, the tenth, a laser retroreflector, is passive, while deploying an X band antenna that will allow for higher data rates. We really want to get those payloads going as soon as possible. That's why we landed at lunar sunrise, so we would have the full lunar day. She said she expected the first few days of the mission to be very busy as the payloads start collecting data. As the landing site approaches noon, the tempo will slow down. Then the lander gets to a temperature range that some of the payloads won't operate. 
so it'll kind of quiet down a little bit the in the middle. Operations will pick up again close to sunset, along with bonus operations such as images of a lunar eclipse on March 14th. Those operations will continue through several hours after sunset, with the lander operating on batteries to collect data such as any levitation of lunar dust believed to occur at sunset. We gave Firefly the challenge of working with us to put together the ops plan to run, over the 14 days, these 10 different experiments. Joel Kearns, NASA Deputy Association Administrator for Exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate at the post-landing briefing. There's going to be science operations every day for the remainder of the mission. The successful landing was a milestone for the CLPS program, NASA's efforts to develop commercial capabilities that the agency could use to deliver science and technology payloads to the moon at lower costs than conventional government-led missions. NASA adopted what it called a shots-on-goal approach to CLPS, warning that not all the missions, particularly at the beginning of the program, would be successful. The first CLPS mission, Astrobotics Peregrine Lander failed to reach the moon in January 2024 because of a propulsion failure, followed by the hard landing on IM-1. We asked these companies to do a really, really difficult thing, Kern said at the briefing. He credited Firefly for being very rigorous technically in the design and operations of their lander. Firefly is a prime example of how NASA is leveraging the entrepreneurial spirit and innovation in the commercial space industry, said Vanessa Weich, acting associate administrator of NASA, at the briefing. The landing was also a milestone for Firefly Aerospace. The company started as a launch vehicle developer, but has since diversified into spacecraft and lunar landers. There are synergies among those product lines. If you think about the lunar lander, it's really just a spacecraft with legs. Kim said in an interview, adding that the company's expertise in engine development for launch vehicles translates to the thrusters needed for Blue Ghost. We're a perfect company to design very capable, high-performing lunar landers. Blue Ghost opens up opportunities elsewhere in the company, with Kim citing operations of the lander while in Earth's orbit and in transit to the moon. We just opened the whole company up to do things in LEO, MEO, GEO, Cislunar, and the moon, he said. Furthermore, the lander is also scalable to go to Mars. Firefly Aerospace has two more lunar lander missions in development. The company won the 2023 CLPS Awards for Blue Ghost 2, a lunar lander mission to the far side of the moon that will also deliver ESA's Lunar Pathfinder mission to orbit around the moon. NASA awarded Firefly another CLPS award on December. 18 for Blue Ghost 3, a lander to the Gruthuizen Domes region on the near side of the moon. That task order is valued at $179.6 million. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.